This is the show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in the tri-state region, including West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky, and sometimes beyond. During this time of the coronavirus, we're doing something just a little different, and we have invited authors from West Virginia and beyond to recommend books that they think you might want to read during this time when you're stuck at home. So our first um, author today who's going to recommend something to you is Toby Doyle. She is a romance writer who lives here in Huntington, West Virginia. Take a listen. Hello all, I'm Toby Doyle. I'm a local Huntington, West Virginia author, mostly of romance and uh, a lot of romantic suspense. And I'm thankful to Carter Taylor Seaton for giving me the opportunity to brag about one of my favorite book series by local author S.G. Redling. And that would be Trigger, which is her latest book. Let me get my hand off her things there. So Trigger is her latest book. What you probably want to start with, if you haven't read any of the Danny Britton series, uh, start with Widowfile, where we're introduced to the plucky and genius Danny Britton and Tom Booker, who is one of the most amazing villains ever. Um, I can't tell you how much I love this guy. He's got issues, like he's probably a sociopath. He could be a psychopath. I don't know his past, but anyways, has no problem killing people. Um, and he's really good at his job. But I think the thing I love the most about this series, and especially the relationship between Danny and Tom, is that in the first book, A Widow File, Danny finds herself in a very uh, strenuous situation where her entire office is killed. Everybody she works for, it's, it's just taken completely down. So she's on the run with a friend from the office, and only the two of them survive. And if you're like me and haven't been to the hair salon in a while, you need something to keep your mind off the craziness. Um, this will do the trick. Anyway, during the chase, it's revealed that Tom Booker has been assigned to kill her. And here's the thing. Tom, while very good and conscientious about his work, feels bad about having to kill Danny. And not that this is a romance, but there is a very odd romantic arc here. I absolutely love Tom Booker. I am the number one person in his um, Tom Booker fan club. Fight me for it. Um, and the thing about Tom is that he's, like I said, really good at killing people, feels really bad that he has to kill Danny. And it's just this weird twisted thread that goes through the entire series. While he's so cold and calculating with everyone else, with Danny, he's like an 11-year-old adolescent discovering feelings for the very first time. So definitely, and the humor hits are fabulous. Like the whole, the humor hits with Tom and Danny are fabulous. Um, so the first book, Widow File, we are introduced to uh, Tom Booker and Danny Britton, and she runs for her life from, uh, from Tom and as she should because he will actually kill her. I mean, he feels bad about it, but hey, a job's a job, right? We got to do what we got to do. So um, in the first book, she is able to escape, which brings us to the second book because clearly if he had done his job correctly, he should be dead. Um, so the second book is called Redemption Key, which takes place in a little lovely place in um, Florida. And I really love S.G. Redling's characters. Um, even the secondary characters are really well fleshed out and give you a sense of um, just who they are and who Danny is through her eyes. And, and she's not perfect, trust me, she's not. I mean, she's plucky, she's petite, she's kick-ass, she's a fabulous um, heroine. She's kind of like the, um, you know, Jack Reacher is this six, six guy. She's like five foot something maybe. Um, but they both are super good at what they do. Um, so in the second book, there's a really interesting mystery surrounding the place that she's working at and Tom shows up. So that's kind of fun. And then in the third book, uh, Trigger, she's fighting literally against a time clock. So all three books, great tension, 
wonderful pacing, awesome suspense, definitely on the line of Dean Koontz or Lee Child or um, Michael Connolly, right? Those, those, are, those are my go-to reads, and so is S.G. Redling. So start with Widow File, move on to Redemption Key, and then read Trigger, her latest. Even better, I have to mention that all three are available on Amazon's Kindle Unlimited program, and the first two books have audiobooks. So you can not only, uh, you know, listen and to the audiobook while you're, you know, doing gardening or pretending to care about your kids, um, or you could read the ebook. And you can still order the paperback. And these have the absolute benefit of being able to smack your kid when they won't stop talking. So just a thought. Not that I would ever encourage smacking your kids. Um, anyway, so I am happily empty nesting. Just don't be afraid. Don't send CPS my way. Um, and highly recommending S.G. Redling's Trigger, Widow File, and Redemption Key. Thanks again to Carter for letting me talk about my favorite villain, Tom Booker. Our second author is Meredith Sue Willis. Meredith Sue is also from West Virginia, though she lives now in New Jersey. Her books include Oradell at Sea and her latest calls, called These Houses. She um, teaches in New Jersey, teaches English, and we're delighted to have her give us a couple of recommendations. I am a native of Shinston, West Virginia. That's in the north central part of the state, West Virginia being the only state that's completely in the Appalachian region. I'm a writer. Um, I'm a teacher. I've written many books, um, and I tend to write them about West Virginia and Appalachia, even though I no longer live in the region. I come back as often as I can. I feel deeply connected. I feel like I am a West Virginia and an Appalachian, but I've lived away for a long time. So one of my major themes actually is leaving, coming back, uh, the clash between cultures, people who um, look at the world one way, people who look at the world the other, and how can we join forces and look at the world together. One of the ways I share my thoughts about books, uh, not my own books, but you know my reading, is um, on an online newsletter. And I, I have the um, URL of it here. It's on my website. And I put it out, I don't know, every six weeks, two months, something like that. And essentially just write about books that I like to read, all kinds of books, uh, Victorian novels, nonfiction, fiction, Appalachian literature. Um, but the thing I wanted to say about it was that I invite people to send in their own reviews. I really love the idea of having a place where people can talk about books, um, even briefly, uh, informally, in writing uh, about books that they recommend. Uh, and you're welcome to use the same reviews on Amazon.com and to send them to me as well. So if you get a chance, go to my website and um, and do, do send me some reviews. And don't forget to help out your local author by reviewing their work on Amazon.com. I'm going to talk about three books that I respect a lot and enjoy a lot. The first one is um, from the middle of the 20th century, and it's um, not by a West Virginian, but by a woman from Kentucky. You probably know her name, Harriet Simpson Arno. She was, is most famous for writing The Doll Maker, a book about a Kentucky family that moves to the city of Detroit in order to make a living in the factories. Very sad book. This one, though, I, I don't know why it's not better known than it is, but it, it's like one of the great American novels. It talks about the people who stayed in Kentucky, what their lives are like, how their lives connect with each other, um, and there's a, there's a, a central trope of a, um, a fox 
who all the men are hunting. And uh, the novel is really about the, 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 the culture and the people who live in Kentucky, which was Arno's home. She later married and moved to Michigan and is in fact claimed by both states. She's claimed both by uh, Michigan and by Kentucky, and rightfully so, because she's worth being proud of. But that, that book published in 1949 is really worth looking at as a kind of quintessential story of Appalachian life, life in the mountains, in the hollers of, and, uh, uh, of, of people who that's where their home is. Um, the next book I want to mention is much more contemporary, just a couple of years old, published by West Virginia University Press. And this book is by a woman named Nancy Abrams, and it's called The Climb from Salt Lick. Now, Nancy Abrams is the opposite of me. She's a, a come here. She chose as a very young woman in her early 20s to move to West Virginia. She had an opportunity for a journalism internship and then a job in Preston County. And she falls in love with the people. She writes about the people. She photographs the towns and the countryside, uh, ends up as a, a subsistence farmer in a relationship with a, a man she loves. They have children. Um, and it, it, she, she's still around. She's still, I think she left West Virginia for a while, but she's back now in, in around Morgantown. And it's a really interesting book. It's about West Virginia, uh, the Appalachian Mountains, life and the difficulties of life written by somebody who chose to be there and also studied with great specificity the people of that particular county of West Virginia and a small place. And that specificity is what's uh, so wonderful about it. The third book I'm going to mention is um, a, a scholarly book. It's a background book, not particularly hard to read. And this is a Oh, it, this was the book that I found that answered J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, which, of course, for people who don't know, was a, a, the book that, um, a, not, not a bad memoir of a young man, but it, it does badly generalize about Appalachians and uh, poverty and a kind of doulessness that it verges really quickly on stereotype. Um, and again, I think it was a worthwhile memoir, but all the people who have taken it as a picture of Appalachia have, have been misled. Um, this book called uh, Ramp Hollow uh, is, is published by, um, what is it published by? Hill and Wang. And the author is um, uh, a scholar. Uh, the book is, 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 uh, has a, is a fairly jumps around a bit, you know, it's, it's not aimed at being a, a great narrative, but it has fantastic ideas in it and gives you a really strong picture of what underlies both the strengths and the poverty of Appalachia. Uh, I want to mention one of his theses, which I just uh, really fascinated me. It was about the people who we now think of as poor, the people that uh, Harriet Arno in Hunter's Horn um, gives you know heroic qualities and, and, and says wonderful things about but but also realistic things but uh, Stoll in his book Ramp Hollow gives background on that he said the first Europeans in Appalachia and of course this is skipping over the Native Americans who preceded the uh, northern Europeans who came um, lived what he called a kind of uh, subsistence farm life. That's a phrase I've heard before. And he said for them, the forests and the rivers and the creeks were a commons, which is to say they weren't owned by anybody. Everybody profited from hunting, obviously. A lot of people, uh, you know, the furs, the, the, the meat they got from the forest. People did gathering, they gathered uh, ginseng, they gathered berries, they gathered whatever they could find to eat. They also farmed. They would clear little sections of the woods, often by burning it down and making a kind of rich, ashy soil where they would grow their corn and other prod, uh, farm products. Um, and they also let their creatures run in the woods. The pigs were often ran free in the woods and the cows, and then they would gather them when it came time to uh, milk or to slaughter for meat. And they also uh, certainly used the wood in the forest uh, in small amounts. They built their houses, their fences. They also sold the wood to whoever they could find to buy it in order to have some cash for things they couldn't produce themselves. 
now this is where it gets interesting. This this worked. It was an interesting way of life. You did something different at every season uh, in general. The people were certainly not wealthy, but they lived, um, you know, balanced diet, uh, had a kind of rich, had a rich culture. And uh, the problem came when the government began to give or sell extremely cheaply vast tracts of land in Appalachia to uh, people who had money already in most cases so they could, could buy it. And these rich people, sometimes who lived in Appalachia, sometimes who didn't, uh, wanted the people living on the land, the subsistence farmers who shared the commons, uh, which was no longer common, wanted them to join the cash economy and work for wages. And that was, I suppose, okay in the beginning because people wanted the money. But what happened was that the first they timbered the vast tracts of land and, and cut down ancient first growth forests, turned them into matches in many cases. And, uh, and then when that was gone, uh, the land was degraded and there, was, there were no jobs of that kind. There were more jobs that came. Um, they began exploiting coal and oil. So there, there were certainly, there were jobs at various times in the history of Appalachia and particularly West Virginia, but they kept, uh, the most of the money went to people outside the region. Uh, the money went to, to people who were, were rich and used it for investment. And the people back in Appalachia were no longer, no longer had these balanced ways of making a living and they were dependent on industry. And when it failed, it failed. And of course, this is not even to mention the great degradation of the land that came with the timbering, with um, sulfur in the rivers from the mines, and, and now from the mountaintop removal. So um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's good background, gives you a sense of, of what's behind a lot of what we live with now. Um, and just to, to bring it back to the, to the, to the novel, it, it gives the future of what's going to happen to the people in Harriet Arno's book, but it also gives you in a sense in Harriet Arno's book of what it is we've lost and what we've also to some great extent retained as West Virginians, as Appalachians, and I like to think that we take it away when we go away as well. So I hope you all will consider those books. I hope you'll consider sending me some of little or not so little reviews of your books. And I really do appreciate um, your time today and wish you all well and good health. Our third author is Michael Connick, also from Huntington. Seems to be a run here, doesn't it? Michael is the author of three uh, Cold War spy novels that I think you would love. And her, his most recent is called HPD, which is about the Huntington Police Department, although it is fiction. It's about a police officer who puts his life, his line, his job, and his love life on the line to try and solve a crime that nobody else wants to try and solve. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Connick, and I would like to uh, give you a brief review of a collection of short stories uh, that I have greatly enjoyed, and they are from the book entitled The Lightness of Water and Other Stories by Rhonda Browning White. I met Rhonda in one of our, uh, during one of our Writers Can Read events here in Huntington, uh, where she actually read selections from this book, uh, and I was immediately fascinated and, and taken by it uh, and uh, purchased it, and I have not been disappointed in this book. So let me, uh, and again, she's a Southern writer. Uh, she currently actually lives in Daytona, Florida, or Daytona Beach, Florida, and uh, uh, although she has... Uh, went to school in South Carolina, and she certainly has a good feel for, uh, for Appalachia, uh, as, you can, as you'll be able to tell from this story uh, that I'm going to read a short selection of. This is from her first story in the book called Bond Servant, and I think after I read this little selection, you'll understand why I was so taken by this book and uh, enjoyed it so much. Sit down. I told you I ain't going to no hospital. He stares at me in a hard way that tells me not to argue. I want your word that you'll carry out my last wishes. My throat clogs. I try to think of a joke, something funny to lighten his mood, but the words won't come. 
Mama Groden's old cuckoo clock sounds from the kitchen, as if it's as if telling me it's time to listen, time to do what Pa wants me to do while time is left. Of course I will, Pa, I whisper. You know that. He points, reach me that Bible. I lift the worn oxblood Bible from its place on the center of the coffee table and offer it to Pa. He puts on his bifocals with trembling hands, then opens the leather-bound text to the last pages. Let me read you something. I try not to look surprised, but it's hard. I know Paul reads the Bible, believes in the Lord above, but he's never preached to anyone, always says a man must find God on his own terms, and that he can find him anywhere. The book of Revelation, Paul says, 11th chapter, verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath came, as did the time for the dead to be judged and to give your bondservants, the prophets, their reward, as well as to, to the saints and those who fear your name, to the small and the great, to destroy those who destroy the earth. A wet cough gurgles its way out of Paul's chest and he snatches a tissue from the side table, closes his Bible. He composes himself, and when he looks at me, his eyes are puddled. You get that, Romy? To destroy those who destroy the earth. I start to nod, but shake my head. I get it, Pa, I think. I want to be a bondservant. Dread slops over me like a sm like smothering slurry, and I ache to have Jasper here to hold my hand, to pull me to fresh air. Uh, I, I don't know what you're saying. Pa dabs it a watering eye with a tissue, points towards the coat closet by the front door. You done give me your word. Now look in there on that floor. I stand and my feet feel heavy, like they're stuck to the carpet. What do you mean about being a bondservant? How does that work? He points again to the coat closet, but doesn't speak. I think he must have taken some Oxycontin that's made him loopy, and that's a good thing. He surely needs it. I open the dark wooden closet door and stare at the strange thing on the floor. I step closer, realize it's a hunting vest that stands rigid, rust-colored sticks of dynamite holding it erect. My knees want to buckle. Pa, the word comes out on a half breath. Destroy those who destroy the earth. I kneel in front of the closet. No. What times, Jasper, go in tonight? Five? No, Pa. Look at me, Romy. I turn my head a bit, but my stare won't leave the hunting vest. All I need is for you to drive me up there. People will die, Pa. You will die. We have friends at that mine. Jasper could be in that mine. I finally turn to meet his gaze. His smile comes easier now. His face is peaceful. I'm already dead, doll baby. Only a matter of timing. It's a struggle, but I manage to hold back a sob. Jasper will be coming in soon, won't he? I could go into the mine this evening at shift change. During that meeting, he says. They always meet in that old office trailer near the entrance. Either way, won't be a soul underground except me. He holds out his palms like Jesus on the cross. You take me up there. Go interrupt the meeting to see Jasper. Tell him loud and clear something's wrong with me. I shake my head to clear the cobwebs. Can he really be saying these things? Say it loud so others will hear. Tell them you came straight away to get help. Phone's out so you couldn't call for an ambulance. Paul lets his hand fall between his recliner and the end table, and when he lifts it again, he holds up the phone line he's cut so I can see its frayed edges. He gives me a white-lipped grin. I'll mosey down past the equipment bays while you've got their attention. You and Jasper will be off the ridge before I let her blow. The ones atop the ground will shudder and shake, but they won't be hurt none. <clears throat> he wipes his mouth with the back of his hand. The shafts will collapse. Mining equipment will blow all to pieces. It'll cost more to wade through the EPA and OSHA paperwork and replace all that equipment than it will to shut her down. They'll clear out of here. Fresh pink blooms on his pasty cheeks. My racing heartbeat slows and I chew on a fingernail. It won't be that easy, can it? Jasper won't have a job, a place to work. Hmm, if he's unemployed, we'll have to leave the state for work, won't we? Get out of here? Have a baby in a place where the water isn't chemical soup? 
It's my dying wish. Another cough breaks from his chest, and this time red dots spot the tissue. <clears throat> well, I hope you found that as compelling as I did, because having read that much of that story, I could not wait to finish it to see what Pa did and what Romy did. So that's it for my review. Uh, I hope you're having a, a, a good day and staying safe, and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Our fourth is Pamela Thompson. She has written a book, which is probably part memoir, about um, being in a writing class for 10 Saturdays, and that's the name of the book, 10 Saturdays. So we look forward to hearing what she has to say. Hi, Carter. Hope you're doing good. Hope you're staying safe. Um, today I want to tell you about one of my favorite books. It's called Shrapnel by Marie Manila. I would encourage anyone to read anything that woman writes down because her writing is unparalleled and brilliant. But this book called Shrapnel has a special place in my heart. I love its main character. The main character's name is Bing. He's an older man. He has just gone through a tragedy in his life and there are a lot of extrinsic things happening around him that are changing his circumstances. But he has a lot of intrinsic flaws. He has, he's a very prejudiced man. He's very old school. He has a lot of um, very patriarchal old ideas about how things should be. And, and he gets thrown into a situation where he moves into the local area. So you will love that part of the book because you're gonna hear about Ritter Park and Halger Boulevard. And he's moving into the heart of Huntington, which kind of draws you into the story because you know the locale of what they're discussing at all times. And, he has a lot of things happen that change. It's, it's about relationships. It's about regret and releasing that regret somewhere. Um, it's beautifully written. Every time she writes a book and I read it, I think, does she just jot down ideas and then sentence it up later? Or does all this brilliance just float around in that tiny little head of hers? Because it, everything is just beautifully symmetrical to the next. And she draws you into a story. That's just her ability to do that. And she captures you and she keeps you for the whole time. It's one of those you read it while you're walking. You read it down the hall. You don't want to put the book down because you want to see what happens next. And he moves in with his daughter, his older daughter. And a lot of things happen around him that cause him to um, forgive himself for some stuff, to release some things, and even change his mindset on this, the way that he feels about certain things. It is just a brilliant book. I would recommend it to anyone. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon and I'm sure it's in Kindle. It is called Shrapnel by Marie Manila. Thanks. And last but not least is Mark Harshman. Mark is the Poet Laureate of West Virginia and he has written 14 books, some of which are children's books, some are um, poetry collections, and he wrote a book with Anna Smucker called Falling Waters, which is about um, Frank Lloyd Wright's home. His most recent book is Woman in Red Anorak, and he has some suggestions for you that I think you'll enjoy. Hello, I'm Mark Harshman, and I'm very happy to be here to be a part of the chapter's recommended reading series, and a special hats off to Carter Seaton. One of the books I would like to recommend is the new novel by Isabel Allende. A Long Petal of the Sea. I've just read it, and as richly as satisfying a novel as I could hope to ever encounter, that is what it is. Just a wondrous book with characters in whom I could believe and admire, um, a plot of complexity that seemed to reflect accurately the many plots of a life, and historically, amazingly illuminating. I have to admit to being a little embarrassed to be reminded again of what a sea change the Spanish Civil War held for the history of the 20th century and our ongoing 21st. And even more illuminating was to read about the subsequent history of Chile, a country about which I knew even less, certainly little of its dramatic and traumatic history in this past century. And in the later portions of the novel, I found my characters entering their later years in a way that was both chilling and joyous, or put another way, characters of a certain age, an age too similar to my own, portrayed with a heartbreaking honesty. Let me read just one 
short bit of a paragraph towards the end of the novel. He felt as if even his soul was shriveling. He was retreating into an old man's manias, a mineral silence, into his widower's solitude. He had gradually given up the few friends he had had from before. He no longer sought buddies to play chess or the guitar with. The Sunday barbecues were a thing of the past. I give it my highest recommendation, A Long Petal of the Sea, Isabel Allende. Let me also recommend today a collection of poems by the Canadian poet Raymond Souster. Um, Souster was born in 1921, uh, died in 2012. Robert Fulford has written of Souster that you can't read the history of Canadian poetry without encountering him, yet somehow he remains obscure. His legendary shyness has created over five decades a curious form of anonymity. He's at once omnipresent and invisible. Intriguing. He's a great poet, writes simple poems, um, reminds me of the William Carlos Williams of um, The Red Wheelbarrow. And I thought in honor of this season, we're not getting to celebrate the way we might usually do so, baseball season. I would read you his poem called The Roundhouse, which let me remind you, The Roundhouse was a large, uh, at least semicircular building in which trains would be switched and there would be lots and lots of smoke in the old days. And thus the conceit, the joke being played in this poem, The Roundhouse. The first real year I pitched baseball, we played straight across from the roundhouse. And every time I got jammed up in a three and two count, I stalled around till a black screen of smoke blew across, then wound up and threw it up the gut with no worries at all. But like everything else, that was too good to last. The next year, they tore the old round house down, and I only finished seven out of 13 starts. The smoke gone forever, you might say, from my fast one. And a sweet little poem called Queen Anne's Lace, and surely we need sweetness these days. Queen Anne's Lace, it's a kind of flower that if you didn't know it, you'd pass by the rest of your life. But once it's pointed out, you'll look for it always, even in places where you know it can't possibly be. You will never tire of bending over to examine, to marvel at this, the shyest filigree of wonder born among grasses. You will imagine poems as brief, as spare, so natural with themselves as to take breath away. Raymond Souser, his selected poems published by Oberon Press in Toronto in 1972. And lastly, another novel, The Heat of the Day, by the, where is, there it is, by the Anglo-Irish novelist and short story writer, Elizabeth Bowen. It's a modern classic from 1948, a classic I fear is nearly forgotten here in the States, despite a marvelous film uh, of the same title that starred Michael York, Patricia Hodge, and a young Michael Gambon, uh, with a script written by no less than Harold Pinter. I worry about a novel like this, which, though it pleased me in every way, I fear may not please nor find others. Such beautiful language it has, a prose whose every sentence glitters with precision and intellect. But it demands a kind of patience I'm not sure many of us have anymore. It reminded me a bit of Henry James or Edith Wharton or Ford Maddox Ford, and who reads these any longer, for that matter? The heat of the day. Briefly, it's the story of a love triangle one immensely complicated by the fact that one man is a lovable yet treasonous English spy, 
and the other is a selfish yet somehow sensitive patriot. As for Stella, our heroine, she rises above anything I could say here, and it demands, quite frankly, the entirety of the novel to define her. The story's descriptions of life in London during the Blitz would make this novel a masterpiece to be treasured for generations, if nothing else. Quote, the daytime was experienced as a pure and curious holiday from fear, or these words. In reality, there were not holidays. Few were free, however lightheadedly, to wander. The night behind and the night to come met across every noon in an arch of strain. And this. In these years, the idea of war made you see any peaceful scene as it were through glass. The list, this last phrase, somehow for me, today, in this time of pandemic, carries an ominous, ominous resonance. Is it too easy of me, however, to also think these dark days of quarantine and fear might, however, rekindle a patience with our reading, allowing us to again read great literature as it was meant to be read, one sentence at a time. Stay well. Read. Thank you. So that should be enough to keep you reading for a while, and we hope that you stay home, enjoy reading, and stay well. Thanks so much. This is Carter Seaton, and we'll see you again another time. Connect with Chapters through email. Write to lp4 at zoominternet.net. Chapters has a Facebook page at Armstrong Chapters. Like, subscribe, share, and comment. All Chapters episodes are available on YouTube. Visit the Armstrong Neighborhood channel on YouTube and look for a playlist of all the Chapters programs.